Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining to this webinar uh, where we are discussing our new uh, forecast for Chile, Colombia, and Peru, and uh, our main views for, for these economies. Uh, you will be able to provide uh, questions to our chat in the platform, so I will try to, to answer all of them. Uh, at the same time, um, I expect to be brief in the presentation to uh, give the enough room to, to questions. So we will start with the presentation. Okay, um, the first message I want to, to leave here is that we are more optimistic uh, with the three economies, uh, particularly considering two factors. Uh, the first one is um, a good external backdrop uh, still, I mean, we, we know that we are seeing more risks, uh, increasing risk recently, particularly from the trade war between China and the US. But at the same time, uh, commodity prices remain at relatively high levels, what is very positive for uh, the three economies. And on the other hand, in the three countries, we have observed recently a uh, uh, moderation of political risks, and that is very important. You know that. Uh, we have had some uh, tension uh, recently in all the countries, particularly in Colombia and uh, Peru, uh, but these tensions, political tensions, uh, have decreased uh, recently. Uh, in terms of uh, our, our projections, um, I want to, to highlight that um, the main, maybe, key factor, what the main assumption uh, to uh, our forecast, for our forecast, here is a recovery of investment. This is very important. You can see that in, in the uh, second uh, chart in this uh, slide. Um, we are expecting a better performance of private investment in particular after this uh, mention uh, decrease in political tensions in the, in, the, in the three countries. Of course, higher commodity prices it will contribute to better uh, investment, higher investment in oil uh, investment in, uh, in uh, Colombia and in, in copper, particularly copper investment in Chile and Peru. So after several years of a very sluggish or even negative performance of investment, we are expecting a gradual recovery ahead. And particularly we expect a good uh, numbers in 2019. As you can see, we are expecting um, an uh, increase in investment in, in uh, Peru of 4% this year, in Colombia close to 4% as well, and in the case of Chile, close to 5%. Uh, other factors to mention that are common for the three economies is that we expect monetary policy uh, to remain stable in the very short term. Uh, we are expecting in the upcoming months the three central banks to remain on hold at current levels. Uh, and in the case of Chile particularly, we expect uh, the discussion of a first uh, uh, rate hike uh, by December this year. But uh, in the case of Peru and Colombia, we expect the discussion of uh, increased uh, tax, uh, sorry, rates in the first quarter or the first uh, half of 2019. On the other hand, we continue to see a gradual consolidation in fiscal accounts and uh, the, the external accounts after the imbalances uh, that were created after the collapse in oil prices and copper prices in, in recent years. Uh, and uh, the overall, the recent performance of accounts, external and, and fiscal, uh, has been uh, positive in the three countries recently. Uh, all this said, um, I want to mention that uh, the main challenge for the three economies is, I would say, a common challenge, uh, is uh, fiscal accounts. Uh, as you can see in the left-hand uh, chart, we have um, a, that fiscal revenues in the three countries are relatively low as a percentage of a GDP. Uh, so after the collapse in commodity prices, structurally, uh, the, the revenues, the fiscal revenues for the three economies uh, is low down. So we have uh, challenges to increase these 
uh, fiscal revenues in the three countries, or on the other hand, uh, to uh, decrease spending. The problem with spending, as you know, several countries, including uh, Peru and Colombia, have uh, said that the proposal or the goal is to uh, decrease unnecessary spending. The problem for the, the, these countries is that uh, the flexibility of uh, spending is very, very small. Uh, as you can see in the right-hand chart in this slide, uh, particularly in the case of Chile and Colombia, the proportion of the budget that is flexible, the proportion of the budget that can uh, be uh, modified is relatively restricted. Uh, so the proposals to decrease spending are very, are very challenging. Uh, in that uh, sense, we are seeing or we will see in the upcoming uh, years uh, several proposals and several efforts uh, from all the governments to try to continue consolidating uh, fiscal accounts. Again, I think that uh, fiscal accounts remain uh, a big challenge for the three economies in a moment with uh, fiscal revenues are below the levels of previous years and at the same time uh, the, 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 the fiscal needs in several fronts are higher than uh, in, in uh, five, six years ago, particularly in social, in social items. Um, I will start uh, with the specifics uh, for each economy, starting with Chile. Um, we are more optimistic uh, on Chile right now than previously, uh, particularly because, because we have observed a stronger than expected a performance of activity in this economy. Maybe one of the sectors that uh, have surprised uh, to the upside recently in a stronger manner is a uh, construction sector. We have observed a good performance of investment related um, indicators recently, particularly those linked to the construction sector. And that make us more optimistic uh, on the view on investment uh, in, uh, in Chile. But at the same time, recall that we have had a very a positive a statistical uh, base effect coming from the uh, Las Condidas labor strike uh, last year that uh, has allowed, uh, allowed a, a good performance in year over year trends of most indicators in the Chilean economy. So we are increasing in this report uh, our GDP growth forecast for both 2018 and 2019. Uh, we now expect uh, GDP growth this year of 3.7%, next year 3.5%. And recall that the Chilean economy uh, grew 4.2% in the first quarter of this year and in sequential terms the increase was 1.2. This overall is the best performance in the last five years in the Chilean economy. And again, it's not only uh, a statistical effect, is uh, overall all sectors in the Chilean economy are recovering. That said, I, I would mention that 30% of the increase in GDP in the first quarter of this year was explained by the mining sector. Uh, which increased by 20%, uh, a very strong uh, figure. Again, this particularly explained by the strike in the La Escondida mine uh, last year. That said, in April, we observed a very strong increase in activity in Chile, almost 6% of growth. And uh, the, the good news is that most of this expansion was explained but non-mining sectors. So we continue, or we are starting to observe a uh, higher dynamism in other sectors uh, different to, to mining uh, recently in, uh, in Chile, uh, including investment and consumption as well, particularly services. Uh, so the increase in our GDP growth forecast for this year is particularly based on these good uh, results uh, recently the positive carryover effect that is implied in these good uh, figures uh, starting the year. 
and investment surprising to the up, to the upside uh, recently. Maybe the main challenge and the main risk to the Chilean economy in the short term, uh, I mean, setting aside a foreign risk, external risks, uh, locally, the, the main risk uh, is related to the labor market. Uh, the labor market uh, has shown recently or continues to show better a um, uh, uh, good performance in terms of jobs creation that led particularly but public positions at by non-salary jobs. So quality of jobs of the labor market in Chile uh, continues to, to weaken and that's a concern. In fact, it's a concern that the central bank has mentioned recently in uh, all the statements is in fact the, the main risk that they are seeing on economic activity ahead. Uh, so the labor market performance uh, has to be uh, closely monitored uh, in the upcoming months. Uh, what we need to observe in Chile to be more, to have more clarity about a strong recovery in consumption is that salary jobs start to rebound, to recover. And that's not, uh, had not, not been the case, uh, been the case uh, recently in, in the Chilean economy. Uh, you can see, in fact, in the, in the right-hand uh, chart, uh, relevant deceleration in uh, real wages uh, recently. So that has been the result of both higher inflation and uh, uh, a slowdown in nominal wages. According to the, to the business perception report that is released by the central bank in Chile, uh, it's very likely that in some regions, a uh, higher immigration uh, is affecting the labor market. Uh, for example, Venezuelan people and Colombian people and Peruvian people uh, are uh, arriving in a, a stronger pace uh, to Chile recently. And some firms uh, stress that that uh, is affecting uh, the performance of nominal wages. So, of course, the combination of, lo of lower nominal wages and higher inflation is implying a, a deceleration in real wages, what is a negative for consumption. So, again, we have to monitor the performance of uh, the labor market in Chile because it's the main risk that we are seeing right now on the economy and particularly on consumption. All that said, uh, we expect private consumption to increase 3.5% this year and next year uh, 37 from 2.4% last year. I want to highlight something. Uh, maybe it's a, it's a question that I received uh, from a couple of clients recently. When you observe the performance of uh, consumption in Chile, uh, this is led by durable goods and services, but non-durable goods uh, have posted a negative performance recently, or not negative, but a sluggish performance. According to several firms, uh, this is uh, apparently explained by the absence of Argentinian, uh, Argentinian tourists. Recall that last year, Chile uh, had a very strong uh, increase in tourism from Argentina because of the appreciation of the Argentinian peso and the good, uh, the better performance of the Argentinian economy. This year, that tourism has strongly decreased. So in several firms and several regions on Chile, uh, firms have said that they have observed as uh, a slowdown in non-durable good sales because of the, this decrease in tourism. So this is important to mention that last year, Argentina benefited several sectors in the Chilean economy, and that is not the case in 2018 so far. On the other hand, uh, as I mentioned before, we are more optimistic about investment uh, in Chile. Uh, particularly following the victory of uh, Sebastián Piñera, 
uh, in the presidential elections at the end of last year. Uh, and um, we uh, have started to see uh, hard data that supports our view of higher investment. Uh, particularly, uh, the Chilean Chamber of Construction and the Capital Goods Corporation uh, have increased the investment projects expected for the next year. You can you can see that in the left hand uh, chart in the in the in the slide seven. Uh, overall, uh, there are more optimism uh, about uh, about the investment ahead. And firms are more optimistic, particularly about optimistic about uh, the domestic demand ahead, particularly because lower uh, political uncertainty and higher uh, copper prices. So they are expecting overall a better performance of the economy. Uh, on the other hand, when you observe again the, the business perception report of the central bank, several firms uh, stress that they are uh, expecting or planning to execute investment projects that were or had been put in on hold before elections. So there is evidence uh, that in Chile, several firms postponed investment decisions until elections. And gradually, these investment projects should start to be executed. And we expect that to be more evident from the uh, second half of this year onwards and maybe in 2019. Uh, so again, we are more optimistic with investment and we increased our uh, investment forecast for this year and for 2019. We are now expecting 4.7 and 5% respectively. In terms of monetary policy uh, and inflation in Chile, uh, we don't have, we haven't had like uh, several pressures on either side recently. Uh, in fact, we have, uh, we have observed some gradual recovery of inflation. Uh, that has been the result of uh, some uh, statistical base, particularly on food prices and, and volatile uh, items. Uh, but we have to acknowledge that in the the last two months, um, particularly the, the previous weeks, we have started to observe or, or to have some upside risk to inflation coming from uh, supply uh, factors, particularly the increase in the FX, the depreciation of the Chilean peso, uh, is uh, creating some upside pressures on some items, items of, of uh, a CPI in, in Chile, particularly on goods. Uh, remember that the inflation in Chile is particularly, uh, I mean, sensitive uh, to, to uh, the pass-through from the FX. Uh, so the recent increase in the uh, Chilean peso has indeed created uh, upside pressures on inflation expectations in Chile from the market, from the consensus. And at the same time, higher oil prices are uh, putting pressures on gasoline and overall fuels prices in Chile as well. So the recent performance of inflation and inflation expectations in Chile uh, has been left particularly because of supply factors. But the problem, uh, I would say the problem, the issue, is that that this increase in uh, or this shock from supply factors uh, is creating upside pressures on inflation expectations. In the end, as a result of this, we have increased our GRM inflation forecast uh, to 2.7% from 2.5% uh, previously. And at the same time, we are bringing forward our estimate of uh, the first uh, rate hike by the central bank. We now expect the uh, Chilean bank to increase the interest rate for the first time in the hiking cycle in December next year to 2.75% uh, and uh, 75%. And next year we expect another three hikes 
of 25 basis points each uh, to uh, to reach 3.50%, uh, uh, 3.25%, sorry, uh, at the end of, um, of 2019. Uh, so the thing is, again, we are not observing a strong pressures on inflation coming from domestic demand. In fact, the core measure remains very low, 1.6%. Uh, uh, but these uh, supply factors are uh, pushing inflation to the upside and that should imply higher inflation and higher rates than uh, previously considered. Uh, the final uh, topic to mention in this regard is that um, the, as a result of higher inflation, the exante real a reference rate is now more negative than expected before. Uh, that is the other uh, factor that supports our view of the Central Bank of Chile increasing the rate by the end of this year for the first time. Um, finally, in terms of uh, fiscal accounts, uh, we, uh, we are monitoring the proposals of uh, Sebastián Piñera to cut uh, spending and uh, to implement a new tax reform. Um, it's important to recall that Piñera uh, announced a saving plan of $5 billion. It's a very a strong uh, figure, a very high figure uh, that can uh, improve, of course, the fiscal profile of Chile for the upcoming uh, years. Uh, recall that the budget for this year sets, uh, initially set an uh, increase of fiscal spending of 4% in real terms, but our estimate is that if this saving plan is implemented in a linear manner in the next four years, uh, spending will grow not more than 2% in uh, in the next four years uh, during the Piñera's administration. So that is a, a strong change compared to the Bachelet's administration. Recall that spending, public spending during the last government, during the, during the, during the previous government, increased 6% in real terms on average, and Piñera is uh, proposing uh, a strong a slowdown of fiscal spending to comply with uh, fiscal targets. In that set, it sense, remember that uh, the fiscal rule uh, uh, targets changed in, uh, in uh, Chile as well. They set uh, as a goal the decrease of a structural deficit by 0.2 of GDP per year. That compared with the reduction proposed by the previous government of 0.25% of GDP per year. So uh, what Piñera is trying to do is to cut spending, but at the same time uh, providing some additional room uh, to uh, the fiscal rule ahead in order to avoid a contraction of the fiscal spending ahead. So this is very important. Again, the decrease in spending, uh, if, if materialized, is a good news for fiscal accounts in Chile. Of course, these combined, combined with a higher uh, mining revenues uh, is a good news. You can see in the chart uh, that uh, copper-related revenues for the government has uh, more than doubled uh, this, um, this year. So uh, the, all these uh, together uh, point towards a good performance of fiscal accounts uh, in the upcoming years. We are expecting a fiscal deficit of 1.8% of GDP this year and 1.5% of GDP next year, what uh, are very uh, positive uh, figures. And finally, uh, uh, in terms of taxes, recall that, um, that Piñera uh, had campaigned to cut corporate taxes, currently at 27%. Uh, recently, Piñera announced that the fiscal situations uh, impedes to carry out this cut. So in the end, uh, is very important to highlight that the corporate tax at, uh, will remain unchanged 
at 27%. What Pinera uh, will try to do is to uh, uh, simplify the tax system uh, to make corporate corporations more competitive. But again, uh, rates are not changing, uh, changing in the short term. Uh, finally, in Chile, uh, we think that the Chilean peso is uh, right now undervalued. We expect a slight appreciation by year end. We have in our models something close to 615 uh, and for 2019 something close to 610. Uh, we think that, um, of course, the, the recent uh, increasing risks in, in, external, uh, in the external markets are posing pressures on the uh, Chilean peso, on all the emerging market currencies. Uh, but if we assume, uh, hopefully, that we don't have any material risks coming from external factors, we can uh, observe uh, appreciation of the Chilean peso from current levels. In terms of Colombia, um, we are more optimistic uh, following the um, uh, results of presidential elections. We have a new uh, pro-market president and we think that, that that can improve materially confidence and, um, and investment uh, prospects. Uh, at the same time, oil prices remain at high levels beyond the recent decrease in prices. The average uh, year to date is uh, well above the initial forecast. So that can uh, imply a good performance of oil-related investment in 2019. So the first uh, topic or, or uh, figure to mention is that we are maintaining our GDP growth forecast for this year at 2.3%, but we are increasing our, two point, uh, to, uh, our uh, 2019 forecast from 2.8 to 3.3 percent. Why, uh, why we don't change uh, the, two point, the, the 2018 forecast? Because uh, we do expect a recovery in investment and consumption, private consumption, but at the same time we expect uh, a slowdown in public, uh, in public spending. This is because public spending was uh, very strong in the, the first half of this year because of elections. So we expect that the political cycle and the change of government uh, led or lead to a uh, decrease or a slowdown in uh, public spending ahead. So the slowdown in public spending would offset, uh, partial offset the expected recovery in uh, investment and private consumption in the second half of this year. That said, for next year, we are more optimistic but because uh, we have evidence, as in Chile, that firms were postponing investment decisions uh, uh, until knowing the new president. Uh, we know, for example, our corporate clients suggested that they have several uh, projects to invest in in the upcoming months of quarters, but they uh, didn't want to uh, invest until the second round of presidential elections. So once we have the new president elected, uh, we expect a gradual recovery in investment uh, ahead. Uh, in, the, in the next slide, I, I have uh, the, our analysis about the impact of oil prices on the Colombian economy. I want to focus on the first two variables, activity and fiscal accounts. The first uh, factor to mention, or the first, the, the first conclusion to mention, is that according to our estimates, an increase of $10 in oil prices, uh, in, on average terms, uh, can mean up to 2% of additional growth in two years. So this means if we uh, consider that the Colombian economy grew 1.8% in 2017, this implies, this results imply that economic growth could reach up to 3.8% in 2019. 
In fact, if you recall, the Central Bank of Colombia set a 3.7% uh, growth as the initial estimate for 2019, 3.7, well above our new forecast and very well above of the consensus that is at 3%. So, of course, oil prices uh, should contribute in a strong manner to a uh, better performance of the economy, particularly in 2019. And this is because we expect a gradual recovery of oil investment uh, ahead. And at the same time, recall that the stronger impact or, or the, the, the full impact of higher oil prices on fiscal revenues uh, is observed the following year after the increase in oil prices, that is 2019. In fact, according to our estimates, uh, the increase in oil prices will provide up to 0.5% of GDP in additional fiscal revenues for the government in 2019. So next year, we expect a solid uh, public spending, of course, uh, a slowdown in public spending, but this public spending will remain solid at solid uh, uh, rates. And on the other hand, better investment uh, following the victory of the right in the elections. In fact, uh, we have observed a uh, better performance of sentiment and confidence indicators recently in Colombia. Uh, you can see that particularly in the left-hand uh, chart. Uh, we knew two days ago the, the consumer confidence index uh, for, for May and you can see that the expectations uh, component has increased materially uh, recently. This is, this is happening as well in other indicators like commerce of industrial sentiment. Uh, and so we are seeing that the current conditions uh, component remains relatively uh, at low levels, but the expectations component uh, is increasing. Uh, and we, uh, we, we think that it's a very similar performance to that observed in Chile and Peru prior to elections, uh, two years ago and last year, respectively. Uh, so in that sense, we expect that uh, similar to Chile and Peru, investment and private consumption to gradually pick up uh, in the upcoming months and upcoming quarters. We already uh, observed a good performance, a better performance of, of consumption uh, recently. Uh, retail sales are growing 6% uh, year over year, uh, but we expect that trend to consolidate ahead with better confidence uh, and with lower political uncertainty. So we expect private consumption to grow 2.6% uh, uh, this year and 3.4%. 2019 from 1.8% last year. Recall that last year private consumption was strongly affected by the increase in VAT and that effect has faded and uh, that is a good factor to consider as well in terms of consumption. So we expect better sentiment and that to translate uh, ahead in a, strong, a stronger private uh, investment. Um, as I mentioned, again, uh, uh, we, we expect better investment ahead. Uh, we expect the unlock of uh, projects that had been postponed prior to elections. Uh, between and 50% in oil in this year a better than initially uh, expected performance of the 4G program. Uh, 
Why? Uh, because we uh, have had five additional financial closures, uh, closures of projects uh, since the last quarter of 2017. Uh, that's a good news, uh, particularly because we were expecting between four and six additional financial closures uh, this year. So we now think that it's likely to have higher a higher number of financial closures of projects in the 4G program this year. Uh, as I we mentioned in some previous notes, we identified uh, 22 projects with a relatively high uh, rate of uh, success in the end. Uh, currently, we have roughly 15 projects under execution. Uh, in fact, 12 projects under execution, and we expect that the recent financial closures uh, to allow uh, more projects to come under execution in the upcoming months, in the upcoming quarters. That said, we acknowledge that the 4G program uh, remains with uh, several challenges, um, and particularly banks uh, remain with a, a stringent uh, position, uh, and, um, and the overall, uh, the government re continues to uh, make uh, several efforts to widen uh, the, source, the, the, the source of financing for the program. So we have heard recently more uh, uh, foreign banks, uh, funds, uh, financing projects, and we expect the new government to try to continue to make these efforts to uh, to allow the, the, the 4G program to uh, continue advancing, progressing uh, ahead. We expect the 4G program to contribute uh, between 0.3, 0.4 uh, percent, uh, percentage points to, to grow this year and next year as well. Uh, it's a non-negligible uh, uh, figure, but we do acknowledge again, as I well, uh, have uh, uh, made in, in previous notes that the 4G program has advanced at a, uh, a slower than initially expected pace. That again, uh, this continues to, to go on and we expect the, the new government to make the necessary efforts uh, to, 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 I mean, to allow the program uh, to go on, on track. Uh, we have a risk on the Colombian economy uh, that is uh, the building sector, the, the real estate sector. Uh, we have observed a strong contraction of buildings recently. Uh, in the first quarter of this year, uh, the building sector fell uh, 8% in real terms. And we have a very open supply market, uh, particularly in offices, malls, and uh, in, in, in houses, in the residential market. Uh, we expect a very gradual uh, re recovery of this sector uh, because of this uh, oversupply market. Uh, and that said, we, we think uh, that, uh, that the recovery will be uh, allowed, uh, particularly due to subsidies uh, by the government uh, to the mortgage rate, and at the same time because of the recovery in domestic demand and overall the recovery in national income with the recent increase in oil prices. Um, but the negative performance of the real estate sector recently uh, avoids us to, to, to be more optimistic on the economic growth ahead. Uh, again, uh, or that, uh, accordingly, if we observe a, a stronger than a currently expected recovery of construction, uh, maybe we can have a better performance of the economy in 2019. In terms of inflation and monetary policy, uh, we expect a stability on both fronts. Uh, inflation currently stands at 3.16%. Uh, we expect uh, inflation to stand at 3.1% by year end. Uh, we expect the central bank to remain on hold uh, the remainder of the year. Uh, and this is because, again, we are expecting, well, we are seeing a gradual recovery in the economy, we expect better confidence and improvement of uh, private spending ahead in Colombia. And uh, on the other hand, uh, the, the inflation has stabilized uh, near 3% and risks uh, in the short term 
uh, uh, seeing bias to the upside, particularly because of oil prices and uh, oil prices. So we don't rule out higher levels of inflation in up the upcoming months, particularly considering that we have a unfavorable, um, a, a negative a statistical base and uh, in, uh, in, in food inflation in the second half of the year. And at the same time, uh, the recent increase in oil prices uh, has uh, translated into higher fuel prices. So the central bank has some concern about these factors. We acknowledge that these two factors, food prices and gasoline prices, uh, can push inflation higher in the short term. So this combination of better economic growth and the stabilization of inflation should allow uh, or should lead the central bank to remain on hold during the remainder of the year. Um, we expect, on the other hand, the first uh, rate hike to come in the first half of 2019. Initially, we have April as the most likely month to observe this increase in the interest rate. Um, and uh, in terms of in fiscal terms, um, recently the government released the fiscal framework for the upcoming years. We have no surprises, material surprises in terms of the fiscal targets. Uh, the government expects the fiscal deficit to reach two point, uh, sorry, three point one percent of GDP this year and two point four percent next year. We expect the, for the, the, the target for this year to be met. We have doubts about the, the, the deficit for next year. In fact, our, our deficit forecast is higher than the figure set by the government. We have 2.7% uh, of GDP. Uh, and the, the, the thing here is that remember uh, that the tax reform cut corporate taxes. And uh, the current corporate tax in Colombia is at 37%, that is high. Uh, and the tax, uh, the tax law sets a, a figure of 33% next year, a decrease of four points. Um, I, I would say that it's very uh, likely that the government we will have to change the pace of reduction of the income tax. I think that something closer to 35% uh, makes more sense uh, for next year and maybe leave the 33 target uh, for 2020 or 2021. Uh, it's important to mention that each 1% of income tax represents 0.1 of GDP in fiscal revenues. So it's very tough for the government to cut the income tax by four points in one year. So I suspect, my sense is that the new government can arrive to the office and to try to uh, make the cut in the income tax as lower. But at the, at the same time, we do believe that the income tax will be cut. In fact, that is the promise of Ivan Duque. Ivan Duque wants to cut corporate taxes my sense, again, is that maybe that will be made at a slower pace that currently set in the tax law. On the other hand, Ivan Duque has proposed to carry out a structural fiscal reform. But I want to highlight, he has mentioned a fiscal reform, not a tax reform. He means that he wants to change spending in the government. He wants to make spending more uh, efficient to cut unnecessary spending and so on. Maybe the same, uh, the same stance that is following right now Peru or Chile as well. So we expect, or Ivan Duque expects to uh, present the reform to the Congress this year uh, to try to get the approval before year end. But we don't expect changes in, in, in rates Maybe only this change in income tax that I mentioned, uh, a slower uh, pace of cut, that we don't expect any change in VAT or income taxes for consumers or anything uh, related to that. We expect changes 
in spending and he wants to fight against evasion and avoidance. So we expect additional measures on these fronts. Uh, with all this, we, we expect um, that uh, Colombia will preserve its investment grade status. Uh, we don't see material risk on this status, particularly after the result of elections. Uh, and uh, that we do expect that Moody's will cut uh, the sovereign rating to, to triple B minus. Uh, they hold a negative outlook uh, on the sovereign rating, and uh, they have mentioned recently that the recent uh, change in fiscal targets is not, uh, is not positive for indebtedness. So we don't rule out a cut in the, in the sovereign rating by Moody's, um, but in the end, that would equalate uh, the sovereign rating to a standard of Poor's that has a triple B minus rating since December last year. So we don't, we wouldn't expect any material effects on markets coming from this decision if materialized in the upcoming months. And again, we don't see any material risk on the investment grade status in Colombia. And finally, uh, in Colombia, we we see we continue to see a very good performance uh, of, uh, of external accounts. Uh, the current account deficit continues to have a, a very positive uh, behavior. Uh, we expect the current account deficit to reach 2.9% of GDP this year versus 3.3% last year. In fact, we, we, we see a downside risk to this forecast because of high euro prices uh, on average this year so far. Uh, so, so we are comfortable with the recent performance of external accounts. I, I would say the central bank as well. Uh, will all these uh, factors better erode uh, a good performance of external accounts uh, and the victory of Ivan Duque in elections? Um, we expect the Colombian peso to have a better performance or a good performance in relative terms. Of course, recently, I would say that the Colombian peso has reacted to external factors. Maybe some investors took profit after the victory of Ivan Duque. But to be completely honest, our view, our sense is that Colombia remains very attractive in the very short term after, uh, the, the, after lower uncertainty in political terms and on the other hand, the expected recovery in the economy. Colombia has a, a, a lack in the, in the recovering activity, and we expect that to be materialized in the upcoming quarters. So we, we do expect a better relative performance of the Colombian peso ahead. And I would say that current levels are appealing uh, because our models, short-term models, uh, point towards uh, 20, 2,800 level in the short term and we are above 2,900 right now. Uh, that said, our uh, GRM forecast is 2,900, uh, but again, in the very short term, we do expect an appreciation of the Colombian peso following the recent developments in the Colombian economy. And finally, with Peru, uh, we are more optimistic for this year. We're increasing, or recently increased, our, our uh, GDP growth forecast for 2018 from 3.5% to 3.8%. Uh, and we have two reasons for that. We have that the political transition after Vizcarra took uh, the office uh, has been smooth, has been uh, like tranquil. So uh, we, we expect in the upcoming months, the Peruvian economy to continue to pulse healthy a rate of, uh, rate, of, uh, rate of growth. And on the other hand, uh, we, uh, we have um, the, the, that recent uh, figures uh, have posted better, a better performance than initially expected. In fact, the, the Peruvian economy advanced roughly 4% in the first half of this year and domestic demand expanded by roughly 4.5%. So that is very important 
the Peruvian economy has posted a, a good performance, uh, led by particularly higher investment, uh, mining investment, uh, and uh, public investment. Um, public investment uh, so far this year has increased by uh, 16% in real terms, what is a very, very healthy um, uh, rate uh, of growth. But that said, again, recall that Peru uh, has a very uh, favorable uh, statistical base effect because two factors. The first one last year, the El Nino phenomenon, and the second one, uh, the Odebrecht scandal, uh, the, the, the construction scandal. So the recent figures that we have recently observed in Peru uh, have been strongly benefited by this statistical base and calendar effect. Uh, so we expect a gradual slowdown of the activity in Peru because the fading of these good effects, uh, statistical effects, uh, but uh, that said, we uh, expect we project the Peruvian economy to remain growing uh, healthy uh, rates in the in the upcoming months, the upcoming quarters as well. Um, we have we have recently observed a good performance of capital goods imports, semi consumption, uh, and the VAT uh, collection by the government. What implies that indeed the domestic demand is recovering faster than previously expected. So. Uh, we are more optimistic uh, because of this. In fact, I want to highlight that we have estimated that if we uh, have not had the domestic issues recently in political terms and in terms of the construction scandal, uh, maybe the Peruvian economy uh, would have grown at 5% in 2018. So uh, Peru, Peru lost a very a strong opportunity to uh, have a highest growth, higher growth ahead. But uh, again, uh, we have uh, we have, however, seen a, a good uh, performance, particularly in the political uh, aspect uh, recently in Peru, what makes us more positive in this in this uh, front. Uh, for 2019, we remain, uh, we hold our 3.5% uh, GDP growth forecast. Um, and uh, in, in, in this sense, we expect uh, a slight slowdown of the Peruvian economy uh, next year. This is because uh, we won't have the statistical effect that we are observing this year. At the same time, uh, we expect um, public spending to be a sluggish, particularly because we have change in regional governments in 2019. I would say this is very important. I want to highlight this factor in the case of Peru, because in the last two, uh, in the last two previous uh, political cycles, when uh, new regional governments uh, arrived or take the office. Uh, in the first half after this change of governments, we observed a very strong contraction of a regional investment, public investment. In fact, in 2011 and 2015, in the first half of these years, of these two years, a public investment in, in, at the regional level contracted a, by 40%. So this is the main risk to the Peruvian economy in 2019. The government should uh, take measures to avoid a new contraction of uh, public investment at the regional governments. Um, this is a very complicated issue right now because you know that we have a new government that is trying to make, uh, to take measures to unlock infrastructure projects, but in six months, Again, the central government will have, we will have to sit or to meet with new regional authorities, and that is a very strong challenge. So I would say I want to highlight this particular risk again coming from, from politics in Peru, this time from some national 
government. On the other hand, conversely, we have a very positive uh, view on mining. Uh, as you can see, we have only in copper projects, roughly uh, a projected investment of $11 billion for the upcoming quarters. Uh, so if Peru is able to materialize these projects, uh, copper production can uh, reach 3 million uh, tons, metric tons, uh, in the next years, that will be very, very favorable. Uh, in fact, we uh, have some, we, we see upside risks to mining investment as can uh, be observed in the right uh, hand chart in the, in the, in the page. Uh, this is because we have other projects like Pampas del Pongo, Corani, other projects that are not copper projects, but for example, iron and silver projects. Uh, and that is a upside risk to our forecast because we are not including this kind of projects in our estimates for mining investment. In that sense, uh, we, we have upside risk coming from mining investment uh, in, the, in, the, in the upcoming quarters. Uh, and in terms of infrastructure, we are, we are only assuming that infrastructure related to the Pan-American Games and reconstruction after the Nino phenomenon will progress. We are not expecting a good advance of large-scale projects. And this is because we, uh, beyond and despite the efforts by the authorities to unlock projects, particularly with the recent infrastructure law, uh, we continue to observe uh, banks, local banks in Peru, very stringent with uh, or towards the construction sector. So we don't expect a material uh, acceleration of large-scale projects in Peru, at least in the short term. We do expect like projects like Jorge Chavez Airport or uh, the Pisco and Salaberry ports to continue progressing. That other projects like uh, irrigation projects or the uh, uh, gasoducto del sur pipeline, we don't expect these projects to, to progress ahead. We continue to observe uh, challenges, strong challenges uh, in the construction sector, particularly because of these uh, corruption allegations in the sector that make the banks more stringent uh, uh, on, on this sector uh, particularly. Um, in terms of, uh, of uh, monetary policy and inflation, we expect inflation to gradually converge to the 2% to the target. Recall that the inflation in Peru is below 1% uh, currently. And we expect that the gradual uh, recovery in uh, domestic demand, the increase in oil prices, the increase in food prices to allow the, the inflation rate to converge to 2%. In fact, we expect inflation to close the year in at 2.5% uh, and in 2019 as well. Um, we have to monitor the risks coming from oil prices and food prices, particularly, uh, similar to Chile and Colombia. Uh, the recent performance in commodity prices globally uh, can push upside, upside pressures on prices in Peru. Uh, and with this scenario of better economic growth, in fact, recall that the central bank in Peru uh, holds a 4% GDP growth forecast above the, the consensus and our own forecast. Uh, so this, this uh, positive projection by the central bank at the gradual recovery on inflation has made the central bank very uh, comfortable with the current monetary policy stance. So we don't expect any movement in the interest rate in the very short term in, the, in Peru. In fact, we expect the first rate hike to come by mid 2019. That said, again, if the government managed to avoid a strong contraction of public investment at the regional level next year, of course, the central bank can decide to bring forward the, the start of the hiking cycle. But again, that particular risk or that particular 
particular factor of the change in regional in regional governments will provide very very uh, decisive for economic growth and monetary policy ahead in Peru. Uh, in terms of fiscal accounts, it's incredible, it's amazing that we have had six ministers of finance in the last two years. Uh, the, the current minister is uh, Carlos Oliva, uh, and challenges in fiscal terms remain, uh, remain high uh, in our view. Uh, that these challenges are for the medium term or longer term. In the very short term, I would say uh, the sub-execution of public spending can help the government to meet fiscal targets. Recall the target for this year is 3.5% of GDP and for next year 2.9. Uh, and the, the, the lower spending than previously expected by the government can help to meet these targets. The, the big question is for 2021, when the, 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 the law sets a, a fiscal deficit of 1% of GDP. That uh, figure is very demanding, uh, is very tough uh, to be met, and uh, we need to be tax measures and further adjustments by the central uh, government to uh, meet these targets. Uh, of course, the higher uh, copper prices uh, are helping uh, the government to increase uh, collection, and that, again, that can uh, help uh, to, to meet the targets next year and next year. We are not particularly negative with, with fiscal accounts in the next two years, but the, the, the real challenge is uh, in the longer term. Um, and uh, and in the end, uh, in 2019 as well, to recall or to, to highlight this point again, uh, the main challenge for the central government will have to avoid a contraction of uh, investment at the, the regional levels uh, during the first half of 2019. Um, finally, uh, we expect um, the, the Peruvian soul to remain between uh, 3.25 and 3.30 uh, during the remainder of the year. Uh, risks uh, seem to be biased to the upside at this time, uh, particularly because global factors, uh, that Peru maintains very solid uh, external accounts. In fact, we are expecting a uh, current account deficit of 1.8% of GDP for this year and a similar figure for next year. So we are not, we, we, are, we are optimistic with, uh, with external accounts in Peru. In fact, it's very important to highlight that exports uh, would reach a historical high this year of $50 billion, uh, of course, uh, led by, by mining and fishing as well. Uh, recall that Peru is, is being benefited by a good climate that is uh, allowing the fishing sector to have a very good performance uh, this year. In fact, we expect fishing sector to grow probably 30% this year in real terms. Uh, so that, that, that is uh, helping the economy as well. Uh, so in the end, uh, we, we expect a relatively stable effects in Peru uh, with global factors, obviously, uh, as in other countries or other Latin countries uh, making uh, uh, or being a key factor. Um, I am finishing here. Uh, maybe, maybe I conclude saying that we are more optimistic again with the three economies, absent, uh, of course, uh, assuming that external risks uh, remain bounded, restricted. Uh, we think that the current level of commodity prices, that lower uncertainty in terms of politics as well in the three economies, are are helping, uh, are supporting our view. And uh, we expect particularly a good uh, performance of private investment in the upcoming quarters. Uh, if you, uh, if you uh, remember, we have an overweight recommendation uh, for the equity market in Colombia, of course, uh, under the bet of uh, better performance following particularly the, the election of Ivan Duque, that, that was our, our assumption. 
um, and uh, we maintain a neutral uh, recommendation in Chile and an underweight recommendation in Peru. Uh, that said, we are seeing upside risks to the economy in Peru, uh, in Colombia as well, and maybe it's more neutral in Chile. But, but it's the first time in, in several years that we are observing uh, upside risks to our economies. Uh, that said, hopefully we will have uh, a, a negative news from the external environment. Um, and uh, in terms of the fixed income market, we follow particularly the sovereign market in Colombia. And of course, we are optimistic in the very short term, particularly considering again the election of Ivan Duque, the proposals, the pro-market proposals in fiscal terms, in terms of economics as well, overall uh, by the new president. And uh, and uh, I want to highlight that several of our, our clients uh, have mentioned that maybe Colombia is is very attractive in relative terms right now, considering the uncertainty that is present in countries like Brazil, Argentina, and Mexico, particularly considering uh, the, the, the political election that we will have uh, in these uh, later countries uh, in, in, the, in Brazil, in, in Mexico, in the next months. Uh, so we, we expect a relatively good performance of, 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 of Colombia in the very short term in local assets. Uh, and Peru and Chile, we are we're comfortable uh, as well in terms of economics, uh, particularly Peru and Chile have uh, a, a solid uh, external and fiscal account, so they are well prepared uh, to, to, to the upcoming quarters. Uh, of course, we have to monitor uh, the developments around the, the trade war in Chile, in China and, and the US. Uh, recall that China is the main trading partner of Peru and Chile. So uh, any impact, material impact on China's growth uh, can impact directly uh, countries like, like Chile and Peru. Uh, but at the same time, of course, lower China's growth would imply uh, uh, lower commodity prices and in the end, all Latin uh, would be affected. Uh, so we hopefully expect this uh, trade war not to uh, continue to as escalate. Uh, ahead. Uh, and if that materializes, we were more optimistic with our countries. Uh, thank you a lot uh, for your time. Uh, thank you uh, for, for the time for this. Uh, maybe the target, the, the goal is to carry out this kind of webinars. Every time we have a particular um, event in our economies, that especially after the releasing of the quarterly report, so the presentation that I just uh, um, made uh, is based on our report that we released uh, two days ago with the new forecast uh, in for the three economies. Thanks again. And if you have any question, I can attend that uh, to our chat. Thanks.